Okay, if everyone could please take your seats, we'll, we'll get underway, our second presentation of the day. It is a, uh, a great pleasure for me to introduce our next speaker this morning, um, Sean Tracy. Uh, Sean Patrick Tracy is the managing partner of Tracy and Fox, which is a personal injury law firm with offices in Houston and San Antonio, Texas. He's a member of the Texas Trial Lawyers Association, the State Bar of Texas, the American Board of Trial Advocates, and the American Association for Justice. He speaks frequently about trial techniques, epidemiology, and science in the courtroom. He earned his BA in philosophy from the University of St. Thomas in Houston and his JD from the South Texas College of Law, also in Houston. He's a member of the advisory boards for the William J. Flynn Center for Irish Studies at the University of St. Thomas. And most importantly, he is a member, a recent member of the Executive Advisory Committee of the Notre Dame Center for Ethics and Culture. Sean will uh, deliver his remarks entitled The Corruption of Science by Pharma. Nice non-controversial topic. <laughs> Um, so uh, I want to you know, thank Carter for inviting me here. I'm, I'm sort of astounded by the level of expertise here, and I'm glad this isn't a resume contest. Uh, I think I'd come in last. So I am a trial lawyer. I spent the better part of my adult life in courtrooms trying to convince people of what I believed to be true. Um, when I was a... Uh, a uh, very young child, I was 10 or 11, I saw a movie called Inherit the Wind. It was with Spencer Tracy, who was no relation to me, but uh, he played Clarence Darrow, and Clarence Darrow is probably one of the greatest trial lawyers that ever lived, and I knew right then and there I wanted to be a trial lawyer, and for whatever reason, it was always my desire and my hope that I would represent the weak against the strong, and, and so for most of my career, that's what I've done. I've represented people who were injured or killed for whatever reason, the negligence of, 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 of defendants or people or corporations, and primarily what I do now is I represent them uh, against pharmaceutical companies. Most of my career, uh, as a result of what I do, the toxic tort and pharmaceutical area of my practice, I, I travel extensively in the, in the field in the area of peer-reviewed literature. I spend much more time reading and reviewing and talking to epidemiologists and medical experts than I do talking to legal experts. And so about 10 years ago, it, uh, I was involved in some pharmaceutical litigation and it came to my attention that there was a problem with the medical literature, that the medical literature wasn't the uh, lily white field of academic science that I thought it was and that there were all sorts of problems both in the pharmaceutical literature and in what I'll call the broader toxic tort literature. And I started looking up organizations like Otis, the Organization for Teratological Information Services, and all these very neutral, high-minded sounding names. And I did what trial lawyers do, is I started following the money. And when I followed the money, I saw names like Chevron and Exxon and Pfizer and Merck are all the corporations that prop up these high-minded sounding organizations. Uh, and it became very clear to me that, that, that there was a problem. And, and I was lucky I got exposed to a few, um, uh, a few experts, doctors, scientists who had been courageous enough to sort of point out that the emperor wasn't wearing any clothes. But, that carries with it some, some very significant penalties for an academic physician, uh, at least it, uh, it has. And so I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk a little bit about that and about how I think the corruption of science has been perpetrated on all of us. Oh, by the way, let me ask this question. Who here has ever taken any money, got any lunches bought for them, had pens given to them by, <laughs> by the pharmaceutical industry. Okay, who? keep your hands up for a second. Who here believes that influences the, the, the medical decisions you make? So, so there are six honest people here, six. Good for you. Um, this first quote I've got up here, this, this is from Oliver Wendell Holmes. 
uh, uh, Dr. Holmes, poet, dean of Harvard Medical School, doctor, said, I believe that if the whole materia medica was now as now used could be sunk to the bottom of the sea, it would be all the better for mankind and all the worse for the fishes. <laughs> the materia medica was, was the PDR of the 18, you know, 1850s and 60s, is where doctors turned to find out what drugs were being used and for what purposes. Um, I, I, I'm going to submit to you that not much has changed, except everything has been sort of polished up a bit. Now, I, I'm going to play this brief clip. Does anybody know who Peter Getsch is or Gotch? I'm going I'm to play this for you. Can you hear that? Let me can you turn it up. Oh, thanks. They steal far more money and kill far more people than the mob can ever do. So we need to do something. We need to demedicalize our societies. So Peter is one of the people in the world who actually looks at the data beyond. So we cut off uh, D. Mangan. So Peter Gotch has some pretty strong opinions about this. He is, he is the founder of the Cochrane Collaboration. I, I, anybody ever heard of the Cochrane Collaboration? I mean, it's a big deal. And, and it was started by he and, and, and Sir now, I think, Lane Chambers. Um, and it is, it was designed in response to what I'm going to talk about, which is the corruption of science by the pharmaceutical and the, and the medical, quite frankly, big medicine is complicit uh, in this conspiracy. Um, and so he actually has a book. I talked to him about a year ago because the focus of what he, most of what he's done uh, recently has been in the area of psychiatric medication. I'm going to be picking on psychiatrists and psychiatric, psychiatric medication today, mostly antidepressants and SSRIs, because that's where, that's where I've lived the past eight or nine years. And quite frankly, that's where we have the best information on the corruption of science. And, uh, but but I, I, I have no reason to believe that it doesn't apply to the statin literature, to the PPI literature, and, and to other medications. So most people say, when the, when the drug companies say, well, it's all, everything's so expensive because we spend so much money on research and development, and, and, um, and that's really just simply not true. They don't. They spend most of their money on marketing. This is a, a World Health Organization document that shows glo the global pharmaceutical market is worth $300 billion a year. I think it's almost $400 billion now and the 10 largest drug companies control one third of this market. Um, you know, all household names, Pfizer, GlaxoSmithKline, Johnson & Johnson. Um, they currently spend one third of all sales revenue on marketing their products, tw twice what they spend on research and development. And the, this WHO document uh, points out there's an inherent conflict of interest between the legitimate business goals of manufacturers and the social, medical, and economic needs of providers and the public to select and use drugs in the most rational way. So there's, there's built into our system a conflict of interest. The, um, one of the, uh, uh, the SSRIs in particular, uh, the, the, the drug industry has spent uh, probably between 50 and $60 billion marketing them. GlaxoSmithKline bought Paxil from a Danish company for $200,000 in the 80s. And then quickly, because um, uh, they were doing a Me Too, because Prozac, which at one time was the number one selling drug in the history of the world, and then, and then Zoloft came along and Paxil and all the Me Too drugs came on, came on board almost immediately. There is very little money spent on research and developing. By far and away, the most money is spent on buying pens for you guys, taking you out to dinner, 
and, 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 and manipulating to the extent they can your prescribing practices and now far and away the most money is spent with direct consumer advertising so they guarantee when the patient walks into your office he says I want Paxil or I want Zoloft or whatever it is and a doctor is now nine times more likely to give the patient the medicine they request. Most doctors don't think they're influenced but the studies show, show otherwise. In most of the research that has gone on, in particular with, with uh, in the pharmaceutical arena, is, is when it's funded by the industry, we see that it has a, an extraordinarily large uh, or uh, increased chance of being favorable. It's like I always say this, you know, if you ask my mother whether I'm a good lawyer, you're going to get a pretty good answer. When you ask a drug company whether their drug works, you're going to get the answer that you expect. And there's there's an astonishingly small number uh, uh, of studies that have looked at this. When you go to PubMed and you research and you type in sponsorship bias, that's what this is called. When somebody pays for the study, it is much more likely to be favorable to the study sponsor. When you type in that research term, how, how, many, how many hits do you think you get? Anybody get, anybody is PubMed? You get 120 responses total, but when you look at it, there's about four that are actually, you know, specific to this issue. And so um, I, I'm going to go back because I'm, I'm going to show you some early drug ads, ads and I think they're going to be funny. I'm going to show you what they used to do and what they do now, and let's see if anything has changed much. So. Uh, the Allen or the uh, Allen Cocaine Manufacturing Company <laughs> in New York used to sell cocaine tablets. They apparently cured a variety of ills: uh, nervousness, headache, and sleeplessness. Who knew? We can we can take cocaine to cure our nervousness. <laughs> and then uh, the Lloyd Manufacturing Company had cocaine tooth drops, apparently an instantaneous cure for sale in New York. And then my favorite, bear heroin. <laughs> bear heroin was sold for a variety of ills. Uh, uh, it would cure almost anything <laughs> until methadone took its place. <laughs> this is my favorite because it is most uh, uh, analogous to the SSRIs. It is snake oil. And snake oil, <laughs> snake oil says it relieves headaches, neuralgia, toothache, earache, Backache, swelling, sprain, sore chest, swelling of the throat, contracted cords and muscle stiff joints, wrenches, all these things can be cured with some good snake oil. But if you're deaf, you need rattlesnake oil. Yes, rattlesnake oil. Pure, yes, yes. So there's really not much rattlesnake oil and snake oil couldn't cure, and it seems the same is true with SSRI. This is the number of, uh, of uh, approvals and or off-label use for SSRIs. There is almost nothing that, that, that SSRIs won't cure. It's astonishing how many, um, uh, how many uh, maladies they, that apparently they will help treat. Now, um, most of it's untrue. In fact, it's almost all exclusively untrue. We, we know now that it is almost uh, uh, totally, some researchers say it is, it is, it, it is totally, oh, totally what? Who's going to guess? Placebo. placebo. It's placebo. This is the, most of these, these, these uh, uh, diseases, to the extent they're diseases at all, are centered in the mind. Anybody that has them is a very strong placebo responder, and very few studies show any, little, if any, separation from placebo. And so how did they become literally the number one selling class of drugs in the history of the world? How did that happen? Well, how it happened in the United States it, you know, sort of starts at the FDA. This is a real transcript of the, of the FDA and their subcommittee, I think this is on Zoloft, talking about this stuff doesn't really look like it works. And so they say, so the question is, how do we interpret those two positive results in the context of several more studies that fail to demonstrate effect. We've got a bunch of studies. Most say it doesn't work. Two say it does. 
And the FDA investigator says, I'm not sure I have an answer to that, but I'm not sure that the law requires me to have an answer to that. Fortunately or unfortunately, that would mean in a sense that the sponsor could just do studies until the cows come home, until he gets two of them that are statistically significant by chance alone, walks them out and says he has met the criteria. That is a, that is a correct statement of the law. And guess what? Guess how many of the negative studies do you think the, the pharmaceutical company publishes? Right. Right. And so, so that's how this occurred. And when you read the label, when I talk, I, I take uh, experts' depositions. I'm going to take an expert uh, very soon who is a, a well-known pharmaceutical uh, company uh, investigator. And, uh, and I've asked this question a hundred times. What study are you relying on for support for your belief that you should prescribe fill in the blank? And nobody's ever given me an answer. Nobody knows. Nobody knows what the studies are that say this stuff works. So this is interesting to me, especially with SSRIs, from the very beginning of time until now. The target audience is women. All, it, it, this actually is, is a problem in other areas too. There's other sort of selective or preferential targeting of women, but I'm gonna take you briefly through the uh, sort of the history. And so, so women are anxious and women have you know, nervousness and so women, I, I call it femaleism, right? So, so being a woman is a disease that needs to be treated and guess what, we have the, the cure for your ills. And this is, oh, I think the 1940s or maybe the 50s or 60s. Uh, this drug actually is no longer on the market. Um, here, now she can cope though with her children, their child in the headdress because she has sodium butabarbital, daytime sedative for everyday situational stress. And then we have, okay, let's, let's get some rafetamine phosphate for cheerfulness, mental alertness, and optimism. Uh, Strassenberg Pharmaceuticals. And then we have the battered parent syndrome where this poor woman has children everywhere and so has to be appropriately medicated. <laughs> yes, right. <laughs> when reassurance is not enough, why would anybody do anything that, that didn't have a side effect? Uh, Ritalin, the, the time-honored ADHD medicine, which I'm not going to talk too much about ADHD medicine, but you talk about a, a fool's paradise. What we're doing to this generation of children is, is absolutely a crime. Um, and this one I love, the morning, a good morning after a sleep through night after you've taken quaaludes. <laughs> Let's take quaaludes and have breakfast and milk with our children. <laughs> Wonderful. 35 single and psychoneurotic, Valium. <laughs> Valium is what you gotta have. Is that a dating site? Is that a dating site? And so th this, is, this is where the more, more modern effects are, as you know, is, is, is uh, not strictly speaking an SSRI, but it's an antidepressant. It's, um, uh, and, and again, we see women with children. Power that speaks softly, Zoloft. And we see the, 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 the happy mother. What's interesting is all the studies have shown, you know, I have people laughingly, you know what I do, say, when I watch that direct-to-consumer advertising on TV, I think to myself, well, nobody would ever take that. The list of side effects is, is a parade of horribles. The reality is the nonverbal communication in the ads is way more powerful than the words. Nobody hears them, nobody sees them. And here we have mom who, who was depressed and now is wearing a nice business suit and taking her, picking up her kids from soccer practice. Um, so I asked a long time ago, a guy named Dr. David Healy is a neuropsychopharmacologist, psychiatrist, anybody ever heard of him? David Healy, David Healy is sort of famous or infamous depending on which side of the issues you're on. I asked him one time, I said, David, um, if antidepressants work, right, if they work, they're the number one selling drug in the history of the world, if they work, why hasn't depression been eradicated? Why is depression going up? Why is there more depression today than there was 30 years ago, when or 27 years ago when Prozac hit the market? And you ask people these questions and you get a bunch of blah, 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 blah. nobody knows because it's not answerable. It's not, it, it's not possible 
that it's all overdiagnosis. It's not possible that the marketing has led to such a vast overdiagnosis that that explains it all. Is the, rea or the, rea the reality is it, it doesn't work. And here's some literature, Irving Kirsch. Anybody ever heard of Irving Kirsch? He is a researcher at Harvard. He's a biostatistician, and he, he set out to prove that antidepressants did work. And, and then he, he started looking at the data. And what he didn't look at is he didn't look at the conclusions of the peer-reviewed literature we talk all about, and I've heard people say, yesterday, evidence-based medicine. Who wants to be an evidence-based medicine doctor? Everybody does, right? That's what we do. We look at the evidence, and we base our treatment decisions on the evidence. The problem with the evidence is... A lot of times you don't get the data underlying the evidence, you get the evidence that the pharmaceutical company chose to put in the peer-reviewed literature that, oh, by the way, they wrote and then got somebody like Charlie Nemeroff or some equally famous person to rubber stamp, and you never know that Charlie Nemeroff didn't do the study and didn't, didn't write the paper, and, and here we are. We have, we have what is essentially uh, marketing masquerading as science. So, so Irving Kirsch in 2005 reached the conclusion that depression is rising despite increased use of antidepressants. Um, he was on 60 Minutes. Uh, he is the one that wrote the book, uh, uh, The Emperor's New Drugs. There's a whole host of problems with antidepressants because unlike things like yoga, exercise, prayer and meditation, all of which, all of which treat depression and anxiety, at better rates than antidepressants, and guess what? They don't have any side effects. Guess how many people are willing to pay for a study to prove what I just said? Who do you think would finance that? The yoga instructors of America are not going to put together a study to prove what I said is true, but there are people that are starting to look at it because of this, the, the, the obvious problem with the data that we, we do have. This is David Healy again, who says, is prior to the introduction of SSRIs, depression was considered to affect only 100 people per million. Pretty manageable. Since the introduction of SSRIs, prevalence rates for depression are now considered to be in the range of 50 to 100,000 cases per million, or a 500 to 1,000 fold increase. That's not possible. It's just not possible for that to be true. And then we have publication bias. Um, when, they, when they get bad studies, they just don't publish them. That's the bottom line. They just never make it into the peer-reviewed literature. Nobody ever sees them. They don't put them on the labels. If you look at a label for Prozac or Paxil or Zoloft, there is not one mention of negative studies. Even though there may be, there may be uh, 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 with Zoloft in particular, most of the studies are negative. They did a head-to-head. -head. The NIH did a head-to-head -head, uh, uh, trial between St. John's Wort. You've heard of that? Yeah, St. John's Wort and, and Zoloft. Guess who won? St. John's Wort proved more effective than Zoloft. And the National Institutes of Mental Health actually did a, a little printout answering a bunch of questions because they were as puzzled as everybody else because nobody's read the data. And they said, we don't really know why. Maybe they're both placebos. Who here believes that depression is a result of a chemical imbalance in the body or the brain? Anybody believe that? Has anybody read that? Is, hasn't everybody heard that? Who here believes that's true? It depends on when you yeah. diagnose as depression. depression. Yeah. Real depression is a chemical imbalance. What chemical is imbalanced? Well, supposedly serotonin and... How do you measure serotonin? How do you measure it? What's a normal level? Well, I'm sure you can find a normal level in the brain, but what I'm saying is, is that there is depression and then there's what 
requirement is diagnosing and progressing, which means what? You stay at one day a week? That's a different issue, which is equally funny, to tell you the truth. It's not possible to measure those things in detail. It's, no, it's, yeah. it's all yeah. It's certainly easy to measure it depending on your habit and your time that you're going to do that routinely. Yeah, it's done routinely. And, and you know what the literature has showed with respect to, to the metabolites of serotonin and the CSF of depressed patients? Yeah, my knowledge is certainly based upon the time. In 1964, it did. But when the testing got better, it is proven, and most researchers have abandoned this idea completely and totally that there is some chemical uh, uh, explanation for depression. Well, that's, that's true. That's an outdated theory. But there's abundant evidence that indicates that depression is still a neurobiological condition. Just because it's not true in theory to other people doesn't mean that it's an additional indicator that depression doesn't exist. Well, I, I'm not saying depression doesn't exist. To be, uh, be very clear. Depression does exist and has existed from time immemorial before SSRIs and will exist after SSRIs. What I'm saying is nobody has any idea right here and now whether or not serotonin or, or, or too much or too little is responsible for depression. And so my next slide is somebody that agrees with me, or I should say I agree with him. He says, in truth, the chemical imbalance, imbalance notion was always a kind of urban legend. Never a th theory seriously propounded by well-informed psychiatrists. And this is true. And, and the reason we know this is true is every antidepressant that has chosen to tinker with a chemical has chosen to tinker with different chemicals, right? Before, before it, was mono, it was monoamine oxidase inhibitors, it's been tricyclics, it's been dopamine, it's been serotonin. Guess what? Every single one of them have the exact same efficacy rate. Everyone, doesn't matter what chemical you tinker with, the efficacy outcomes are the same. So I'm digressing a little bit, but, but this has been, the, this particular marketing tool is so embedded in American you know, medical practice that, that most people just take, I mean, lay people take this on faith that depression is a result of a chemical imbalance and I got to have a chemical to correct the imbalance because somebody told me I have one. But there's no way to measure it. And I don't think there's ever going to be a way to measure it. And we don't know whether or not, we don't know whether or not depression <laughs> causes an abnormal serotonin level. We have no idea the chicken or the egg and we don't even know whether they're connected. In the emerging, um, so the, we're 27 years in to the antidepressant era, and um, the, the emerging evidence is not only do they not work, they actually they cause depression. We've known this for a long time. There's all sorts of literature, in the, and in 2004 or five or six, all SSRIs were black box, got a black box warning for increased risk of suicide. Uh, and and uh, but now the long-term longitudinal literature that's looking at this, you can see this. This I think is a 2015 publication, or maybe it's 2014. I should have had the site. Shows that long-term use of antidepressants may enhance the biochemical vulnerability to depression and worsen its long-term outcome. So I agree with what you just. Are you a psychiatrist? Yes. Yeah. So so I agree. With, we know from animal models. We know, we know from in vivo and in vitro animal models that SSRIs tinker with the serotonin system. We know that. But in different animals, they do different things. In different individual mice, they may spike the serotonin 
They may make it go down. What we do know is it affects homeostasis. The, the exchange of intracellular serotonin is disrupted. That's a fact. And, and I think everybody agrees with that. The question is, does it have anything to do with depression? So this is a, this is a funny quote. I like this guy, Dr. Drummond Rennie said, this is all about bypassing science. Medicine is becoming a sort of cloud cuckoo land where doctors don't know what papers they can trust in the journals and the public doesn't know what to believe. And that is, I think, where we are. Because so much of the literature in the medical schools, many of them are, are complicit, and I'll get to that in a second, it, you don't know what to believe. Because cause what we really should go to, I think, is not evidence-based medicine, because you're not controlling the evidence. Other people are controlling the evidence. You try to get a pharmaceutical company to release the data behind the studies they publish. Try that. It's, it, it's harder than breaking into Fort Knox. They won't give it up. They won't give the data up. And, and just since we're here at a Notre Dame uh, uh, production, I thought St. Augustine would be appropriate. It's better than the truth be known than the scandal be covered up. Um, so I mentioned David Healy for a reason, other than he's a smart guy and I think he's courageous. In the book, De pardon me? Oh, uh, in the book, Deadly Medicines and Organized Crime, which is Peter Gotch's uh, current book, he talks about something David Healy did. In, in 2000, David Healy, who is a world-renowned uh, psychopharmacologist and psychiatrist, he actually did his PhD. Uh, on the serotonin system. He's probably done more original research or had at one time on the serotonin system than anybody else. He was offered and accepted a chair at the University of Toronto. He packed up his family. He sold his house in Wales, where he was living at the time, and he moved to Toronto. And, and right before, a couple weeks before he was to bring his wife and daughter over, he gave a talk. And he gave a talk on antidepressants, and, and this is, this is uh, a talk he'd given a hundred times all over the world. He gets invited to go speak about this issue. And um, he, he, as part of his lecture, said, oh, by the way, SSRIs cause suicidality. Just a fact. And it was before the black box. And he got a call. In the audience was a Pfizer executive. In the audience was a Pfizer executive. The next day he got a call and he was fired. And he was told the reason he was fired is they couldn't have somebody like him offending the pharmaceutical industry. Eli Lilly, the maker of Prozac, had just written a check for $1.5 million to the University of Toronto and they, they sort of brazenly didn't deny why they were firing him and said, you're finished. Don't move your family over here. Get on a plane and go back home. This is not an isolated incident. So the, the, sort of the Avandia crisis or, or disaster, I don't know if anybody's familiar with it, but the original, I think he was a Mayo Clinic researcher, but, but or, no, he was at uh, Cleveland, Clinic. Cleveland Clinic, the Cleveland Clinic guy. I mean, he, he, he started to say the emperor has no clothes. Uh, 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 GSK came down on him. They, they threatened his career if he, if he opened his mouth. And when he wouldn't shut his mouth, they went to his boss. And his boss did talk to him and try to get him to shut his mouth, and he did for a while, for a while. But then his ethics got the better of him, and he came out, and, and, and quite frankly, he, he may be practicing in, in, in Tijuana now for all I know. <laughs> but they certainly brought, brought pressure to bear. This is, a, this is a big problem. This is a huge problem. And, and, and uh, academic medicine is getting embroiled in this. Uh, uh, Northwestern University, anybody here from, from Northwestern? Northwestern University a few years ago made $750 million because they developed a molecule with their partner Pfizer and uh, they sold their interest uh, for $750 million. That's a lot of money for a medical school. That's a lot of money. And so I'm going to take a, a, I have a trial coming up this summer and this fall uh, uh, over the issue of whether Zoloft causes birth defects. I think that it does and all the SSRIs do. Guess where Pfizer's lead expert works? Northwestern. Northwestern School of Medicine. You guessed it. You guessed it. Anybody in here uh, on the Speakers Bureau for any pharmaceutical companies? No? 
Yeah. Yeah. Should have asked that question first. Yeah. 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 I, it, it, and so what they, uh, I've got some internal documents. I have the money, the amount of money paid to speakers, speakers, bureau people, and key opinion leaders is in the tens of millions of dollars a year. The list is, is, is thicker than a telephone book. And this is, you, guess where they take this, guess which business budget that comes out of? Marketing. They pay the doctors in this country to speak about their drugs or to just be on their side. 40, 50, 60, this is one drug company, 40, 50, 60 million dollars a year. And, and that has ramifications. It creates a bias. It, cre it is a marketing dollar well spent. It is as good, if not better, uh, as giving away drugs for free, which has always struck me as odd. You know, I grew up in Detroit where the crack dealer gave you your first hit free, right? Because he wanted you coming back, right? Once you got hooked, you were on the corner every, every night. That's always struck me as odd. We give, we, give, we, give, we give away free medication, whether it's pain medication or SSRIs or whatever it is, to get people on, you know, get them on two weeks, four weeks, and oh, it's got withdrawal issues. Oh, I didn't know that. Now what am I gonna do? Well, I'm gonna start writing checks. Somebody said yesterday, I sort of chuckled as everybody was talking about the wonderful uh, beneficence of, of the pharmaceutical industry giving away oh, three months worth of a life-saving drug, but only three months. And if it works, well, you can have to start writing checks now. What do you think that person's going to do? So that's just an article on, on, on Dr. Um, Dr. Healy. He actually had a, uh, the, the, the academic response was admirable. He had Nobel Peace Prize winners coming to his defense, and, and they started a campaign, and, 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 and guess what? Nothing happened. <laughs> he still got fired. Everybody got outraged. Everybody wrote letters. Everybody, you know, cursed and swore and said strong letter to follow. And then he went back to Wales, and, and Eli Lilly uh, continued to be happy. Well, four years after Dr. Healy had the temerity to say drugs, these drugs cause suicide, uh, the FDA confirmed what he'd been saying now for six years and they black boxed um, all of the SSRIs. This is pediatric suicide, although there's no significant difference between adult and pediatric, uh, but that's a, a regulatory uh, issue. And so I'm gonna leave you, we've got two minutes left. Anybody know who Marcia Angel is? Yes, she's really smart. Uh, and she's got a lot of guts and and I, uh, I found this interview with her, and I just I want to play it for you. It's brief. I can do this. What we do now, what we find, we have found it is profitable to do, is to pretend that the drug companies and the medical schools are in the same enterprise. That what we're both trying to do is to come up with innovative, important new drugs. And that's simply not true. The drug companies are investor-owned businesses, and their job is to come up with the most profitable drugs they can and to maximize their shareholders' uh, interest. That's what they do. They want to maximize their profits. That's a fiduciary responsibility. Medical schools have no such responsibility. Their responsibility is to the public, to educate the next generation of doctors, to do scientifically important research, not commercially important research, uh, and to take care of the sickest and neediest members of society. And that is what justifies its tax-exempt status. So these missions are very different. <laughs> She's right. They're very different. I often say, you know, uh, <laughs> It, 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 I'm picking on pharma because that's what I do, but um, I, I always say, you know, w w what she just said about what pharmaceutical companies do, you know, you ask the question, why do, why do lions eat their young? Because it's what they do. It's the, in their nature. It's what they do. 
Pharmaceutical companies, it is in their nature, they are for-profit businesses. And if you, I, I give you one other, can I take one more minute? So one other thing that I, I didn't mention, um, pharmaceutical companies put together publication plans. The marketing department in the pharmaceutical companies put together publication plans and they tell companies that they hire, one of them is called Current Medical Directions, they are in the business of publishing literature, ghost writing literature for prominent members of the medical community to stamp their name on them. There has never been that I have seen post approval, not one time has there been a, a pharmaceutical company study published that did not have a marketing objective behind it. Not one time. In 2003, um, uh, or in 1999, Pfizer put together a publication plan with respect to Zoloft where they targeted, they created 85 different articles designed by their marketing departments to populate the peer reviewed literature. And by 2003, 55 of those articles had made it into the peer reviewed literature. Every one of them said, This is the greatest thing since sliced bread. We should be eating Zoloft morning, noon, and, and night. And that, and, and out of the 55 that made it, 43 failed to disclose that Pfizer bought and paid for the studies, and that none of the authors on the papers had actually put in, put pen to paper. They were all written by ghostwriting companies. This is the world in which we live. Um, uh, the disclosure, I'll just say, the disclosure form that you all filled out is funny to me because. That's what you're supposed to fill out. Disclosure hasn't solved the problem. Just because we, we, we can follow the money, the data is still bad. And that's the problem. Thank you very much for the provocative presentation. And go, uh, now we're going to adjourn to our small groups, but, and we'll come and get you at, at 12.15 so you can have conversation. I'm sure there's a lot you all would like to ask and, and engage with our speaker. So thank you very much. Q and A. So, you, do you want to um, do you want to just call on people, or do you want yeah, me to keep it? Okay. <clears throat> okay. Yeah. No. Just stirred up the shit. No, it's fun. <laughs> okay, everybody. If you could take your seats, we can uh, continue our conversation. We have a lot of, uh, I think, a lot to talk about. Um, a lot of questions and answers and uh, engagement. 
So Sean is just going to uh, take questions, and, and you all please, uh, you know, feel, feel free to let it go. Let's, let's do it. Keep the rotten fruit to yourself. Let's get it on. <laughs> yeah. Is there a microphone? Yeah. So what is the solution? Don, you're the emperor? Or, or yeah, so, so okay. somebody in my group asked that, was what is the answer? And I'm not sure. I know people have suggested that we should go to basically government funding or, or non-pharmaceutical company funding. I don't know if that's a real-world solution or not. Um, I, I, you know, maybe now they have to, they're supposed to register all clinical trials at clinicaltrial.gov, but they don't have to register the data. Maybe the data, maybe, maybe forcing somehow, like we did, you know, they didn't disclose, the doctors and pharmaceutical companies did not disclose like this before about 2006, 7, 8, 9, when the New England Journal, Marsha Angel's publication got all embarrassed, and it was the embarrassment that caused the the journals to force disclosure. Maybe we can do the same thing with data. You know, I, but I don't, I don't really. You know, I, I'm a philosophy major. I don't have answers. I just have questions. Yeah. What about some independent type of rating of these studies as to whether, um, you know, the the whole how scientifically valid they are, what they actually prove. You know, because the, even so, sometimes the average physician who is trying to keep up with this doesn't have the time if they're handed a study to say this is a piece of junk versus not i mean that that would seem to be a better way to have have what little is still independent in academia uh to look at these and grade them and say this is an a this is a landmark study we can actually put our foot on this versus this is a piece of junk from GSK, and it's obviously funded. It doesn't really prove anything, you know, some, something like that to, to, because there's so much out there. It in and of itself is an industry. So, so the Cochrane collaboration was actually formed to try to meet that need, is what's the real data out there? And, and they've done a pretty good job, and we have nice guidelines, and there are some bodies that are attempting to do that. Um, and they do look at the pharmaceutical sort of finance studies with a bit more of a, a jaundiced eye. But the, the data is what the data is. They've done a pretty good job. And if you want to know what is the, what is the evidence-based medicine for, for statins or, or, or SSRIs, you can go to the Cochrane group. They're all over the world now. And you can usually, for the big sellers, find something. Um, but again, it doesn't address the, the where's the data. Yes, ma'am. I don't know that they necessarily. Oh, I'm sorry. I don't know that Cochrane necessarily sees that as their role. I think that they're about formulating the best standard of the evidence. So certainly, if, for example, when um, you're working with certain organizations like American Heart Association, American Cancer Association, they'll use that. But I, I really think we need more than Cochrane. They, there's only so many of them. They only do so much. They, even though I think that their founder, that was his vision, they don't necessarily see that as their role. And so something that I think would be constructive to talk about um, is how do you develop um, that capacity to be able to review studies and without having to, um, within, for example, even the culture of ethics, the culture of life, um, how do you develop the capacity uh, to do that um, capacity referring to physicians and scientists and lawyers um, coming together to, to review that. I think that that would, be, that would be an important contribution, really. Yeah, no, I agree with you. I mean, that's sort of that. But how do we get it? How do we extract the data? I mean, that's the issue, I think, that, that we're grap grappling with. Dr. Harrison, is it? There'd be a simply simplistic way to get the data and force it out into the opening. And that is, at least in the U.S., if the FDA, or na internationally, if the GCP uh, ICH, the Good Clinical Practices, included that all consent by the patient who are freely 
participating in these studies and who are giving the data by their participation to the pharmaceutical, if in that exchange that the consent required the data to be publicly posted. Yeah, look, that's a great Not idea. Not to be vetted by the industry. Yeah, that's a great idea. And, and of course, we'd have to change the FDA regs and change the law. And, and, and guess who spends more time in lobbyist office in Washington, D.C. than any other industry? And, and the revolving door between the FDA and industry is a, I could do a 45-minute presentation on that. It's a real problem. That, that same investigator on Zoloft that made those comments I put up there, within about eight days of leaving the FDA, he went to work as a consultant for Pfizer. Yes, sir. Well, believe it or not, I actually agree with you for the, for in, in large part. Is this I'm being a, filmed? I'm, a, <laughs> I'm an ethicist, and, yeah, I can't, right. and yeah. so I'm not a neuropharmacologist, uh, even though I practice psychiatry. And so um, I wanted to state at the outset that I, it, it's tragic to me, the state of the, the field and, and the influence. I, I think psychiatry has, in large part, been very complicit in, in all of this. And, it, and so, um, you know, I wanted to make sure that I yeah. say that at the outset. Um, but I did want to make uh, two comments. One, um, I, I think it's important to note that the vast majority of SSRIs prescribed in the United States of America, 80%, are prescribed not by psychiatrists. They're prescribed by family medicine physicians. They're prescribed by internal medicine physicians who don't obstetricians. do... Obstetricians. Obstetricians who yeah. don't do thorough... They may pin a label. On, on a condition to get bit so that they're able to bill, but they don't do a formal diagnostic workup. Yeah. They don't use a lot That's of the a very tools good that psychiatrists use. So um, to try to tease out exactly what, uh, what exactly we're dealing with. Um, same thing with ADHD and, and stimulants. I mean, really, it's pediatricians who are prescribing those medications without doing any sort of testing whatsoever to confirm the diagnosis. Um, so that is my first point. The, se the second point... I do think uh, in, a, in a certain part of this, the presentation, you overstate your case. Um, and it's, to me, it's the implication that um, because we don't have a uh, consistent or a thorough model for understanding the neuropathology of depression, uh, for instance, the serotonin hypothesis, which is an outdated hypothesis, uh, no doubt, that, that that implies that either the di that the diagnosis isn't isn't real um, or that uh, it's not that the diagnosis isn't real nobody doubts depression exists sure the question is are you going to give somebody a pill when you don't have any idea whether the pill is the cure for the disease sure. and all of the the the, the, the placebo controlled studies show that if it works at all mm -hmm. it works for a very small minority of profoundly depressed people Right. that are at one-tenth of one percent of the population getting the drug. And most people say even then the clinical significance yeah. of the improvement was irrelevant. Well, it's one of the reasons why I practice inpatient psychiatry is because I, those are the patients I happen to see, yeah. um, as well as the chronic schizophrenics. Because, for example, we don't know how, we don't have a good understanding of how lithium works in bipolar disorder or antipsychotics work in schizophrenia, but we know that antipsychotics have allowed thousands of people to leave the asylums and live in the community. Sure. Yeah. But you're yeah. right in that SSRIs have not had the profound effect that, or that antipsychotics have had in our society, which you would maybe expect if, if the efficacy if was, they worked. if they worked, right, right. no. Yeah. Yes, sir. I'll come over here next. Um, I'm, a, I'm a pediatrician in, in sort of in the minority in this group. The, the, early rec the, the early forms of influence on prescribing by drug representatives had a lot to do with selection of brand names. Uh, you got the, the brand with the more attractive name or the drug representative uh, who was, was more charming and friendly. Uh, and so you would, you would have brand recognition and brand names. Perhaps re-educating people toward generic prescribing will help to reduce some of the brand preference. It's a little unfortunate that in many cases, uh, drugs are marketed based on equivalence uh, aspirin is equivalent to nearly all of the other anti-inflammatories. Uh, it basically is very little, really not much worse in terms of gastrointestinal results. But it was given a bad name because of its short duration of action, uh, because of its reputation for causing ulcers, which it can, 
and because of the dosing schedule that it required. But high-dose aspirin was the standard treatment for a lot of inflammatory conditions. It's almost as good as all these other things, except that you've got to take a whole lot of it. Yeah, you mentioned branding. Think about how many drugs begin with A and Z. <laughs> Think about that. That's not by mistake. Yes, ma'am. Well, instead of us sitting here and pointing fingers at the pharmaceutical industry, this is a medical ethics conference. We need to look at ourselves. And we, look at, we need to look at our complicity in this. And you pointed out some of the issues. There are many others that came up in the small groups, I'm sure. And I think that the takeaway message has got to be you have to behave in a way that is professional and ethical and that you can't sell your soul for a dollar. You just can't do it. And some of the things that have happened, the Sunshine Act revealing those on, the, uh, on pharma payroll, the Medicare data dump, as much as we don't like that stuff and as much as we're worried about whether that's accurate or not, Putting, putting a spotlight on some bad behavior is really important. So I think the takeaway for us in the audience is uh, let's make sure that we in the profession do not allow ourselves to be complicit. Yeah, and I think awareness, so sort of both philosophically and spiritually, awareness is almost always the answer. And if you're aware of what's going on and you understand, like if I don't admit that advertising works on me, I'm not going to get anywhere. You know, it works on me. When the good-looking, you know, uh, uh, drug rep shows up at your office with a nice lunch or at my office for, for medical records, I mean, it happens to me, too. If I deny that that influences me, I'm in trouble. I'm kidding myself. Yeah. Um, so I think it goes beyond that, though. Um, even if we go to no drug rep, um, institutions, which most academic medical centers are, even if we, as we have the Sunshine Act, um, we have this thing called outcomes-based medicine, which is driven by data that may be compromised. And if I see someone who, on a psychological assessment in my palliative clinic or in primary care clinic that says I feel depressed, one outcome measure that could be demanded in hyper-regulatory medicine is that they be on an antidepressant. Um, we have these simple fixes for complex patients, and I'm afraid that outcome-driven medicine is going to mechanize um, this and will move more and more away from what psychiatry and psychology originally were before the 19th century, the care of souls and not mm -hmm. the care of neurotransmitters. Yeah, and I will tell you, I've talked to psychiatrists about this, and they sometimes get angry with me. Uh, because, they, But the, for a real reason, and, and it's like, what are we going to do? The tricyclics didn't work. Valium's got addiction problems. If the SSRI, I'm, I'm, nobody does MLIAs anymore. We can't do Valium and Xanax because people get addicted. And what are we going to do? And uh, quite frankly, I think you have the answer. But it's not an answer that, that I think most pe people here probably would understand that that is good counsel, that that's good, you know, uh, good advice, medical advice to get. There's, there, there is literature coming out that with depression specifically, that, that exercise, yoga, and other non-drug interventions work as well or better without any side effects. Um, but, you know, I talk to doctors, who says, you know, lose 30 pounds and run three days a week or take this pill. What are you going to do? You know? Oh, you can take a pill. Yes, ma'am. Depression is an enormous issue in the VA, and you have patients for whom those interventions don't work. We, tr we actually use those interventions. We use um, fish oil and um, EFAs and so on and so forth. You do have a, a subset of patients for whom pharmacotherapy does work, and you have a subset of obstetrical patients as well who will definitely kill themselves, who will kill themselves if they are not on their antidepressants throughout and you watch them deteriorate because you try to take them off preconceptually, try to hold them off, and they spiral down into depression and they will kill themselves. So you, you do have, I think, I just want to be careful to say that there is a role for pharmacotherapy. I think we need to be more rigorous in our diagnoses of depression 
we have to be more rigorous in our counseling. We have to acknowledge, for example, with the whole birth defect data that yes, there is that risk, but fetal mortality is 100% if the mom kills herself, right? Yeah. So that's that's something that we really need to keep in mind. And then yes, if this and there's really good data, for example, showing that there's cognitive impairment and delayed milestones in moms who took SSRIs. All that is true. All that is is what may happen, but it's what you have to do as a clinician. And so I think that the answer to misuse is proper use, in my opinion, and that's that's what we need in addition to maybe having an independent group of clinicians, lawyers, and ethicists to review some of the, the literature and, and try to find um, some of the, on some of these drugs to try to find the literature that's not being published or the small trials that you could put together in a meta-analysis, um, I think will go a long way. So. You, you said a lot. I just want to comment on two things. One, look, I, I'm not a doctor, you know, um, uh, and, and I do think, I, but I've thought about this a lot, it, it, even if it is a placebo effect, if I had somebody profoundly depressed and it worked as a placebo, I'd probably use it. You know what I mean? If, that's, if it's a life or death, suicidal ideation, suicidal history, or, I think you probably use it, even as a placebo. Who cares for that patient? But that patient is very rare. That, that patient is rare in terms of it, 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 when you look at the total population of people taking the drugs. Um, do you remember a time when, for you to mention women in, in depression, do you remember a time when we told women not to take anything while they were pregnant? That has totally changed in the last 20 years. And, and that is a result, I know this because I've seen the documents, that's a result of pharmaceutical company influence. They are populating the literature with all these parade of horribles about what will happen if you don't chemically treat depression and pregnancy. And so, so it is completely flipped on its head in the last 20 years, and that began in the marketing departments of the pharmaceutical industry, and I've seen those documents. Let, let me get somebody else there. Here I am, oh, finally. Who? Oh, sorry, yeah, yeah. What the are the, the Canadian doctor, yes. Right, right. The token Canadian. Very polite doctor. Sorry about my comments in yeah. advance. Yeah. I apologize for that. <laughs> uh, what are the chances and legal processes of eliminating or reducing direct-to-consumer marketing in the United States? I don't As we have in Canada and Ireland, no direct-to-consumer marketing. Yeah, I just don't see it happening. I mean, it's so hard to unring the bell once the money gets involved and once, I mean, I just, it's been so successful. It is, it, it, I mean, you talk about you know, the days when they used to knock on your door three days a week or four days a week. I, I don't know if they're, are they still doing that as much? Not, not, I don't, that's what I hear, not as much now that we have direct-to-consumer because that's where their budget is moved. I mean, they spend billions of dollars a year on TV and I just... Right, right, golf. Yes, yeah, look at those people dancing through the tulips. They look happy. I want to be that person. So, Carter, thank you for inviting a trial lawyer to this, to this meeting, because I think, uh, I, I think Marcia Angel would suggest that you understate your case. She would. Yeah. Uh, in, her, in her book, uh, The Truth About Drug Companies, she suggested, and her thesis was, that the drug companies justify direct-to-consumer marketing and detailing uh, physicians' offices and pens and fishing trips and all this stuff because they're doing primary demand simulation for a market that they see. And, and depression is a huge market, right? Yeah. Um, so what can we do as, as eth ethically-minded physicians? Um, I think uh, when you watch um, 60 Minutes, and every time they tune out for a commercial, it's Ask Your Doctor commercial, right? Silence it. Um, when I go to a national meeting, I'm, I'm a surgeon, when I go to a, a national meeting, if I see a study that's being presented, and I see it's funded by, uh, by an industry, I walk out. Because it just doesn't have, I, I don't know what that means. Stick to the big journals, stick to New England journals, stick to journals in, in our respective specialties that we know and trust or at least we've come to know and trust. Uh, New England Journal and JAMA is all I read now because I stopped reading the surgical journals. I'm more interested in ethics. 
Um, but I think there are individual behaviors that we can take. You know, don't, I won't, I, I never, when I was in practice, I never would see a, a, a detail rep. So I just didn't want, I didn't want it to be, I didn't have time for that, frankly. But I think we, I think we do it. We are complicit. And we fund this industry by our behavior. And Marsh Angel would say that, well, they justify this based on R&D. I've got to have, got to have the money for the R&D, all these great new drugs. But she says that there are no great new drugs. I mean, they come out like much guns every 20 years. How much do They're you think it, how much do you think it costs to bring a drug to market on average? The, the, so you're right. But the drug company usual mantra is $1 billion. That's the number they throw around. It costs a $1 billion to get a drug to market. It's really $55 million. The drug industry is the most profitable industry in the history of the world. 20% margins? 30%. 30% margins. 30% margins. And the average Fortune 500 uh, company is what, 5%? Yeah, yeah. 4 to 5% so is considered complicit. great. Yeah. And most of them are Me Too drugs. There are no, there's no new R&D costs. They're just, they're just copying drugs. So, so the Me Too drugs, you know why they exist? They exist because the federal governments will pay for them. And as soon as they get on the Medicare payroll, drug companies leap into action to do a Me Too. There is really no innovation going on. You're right. Almost everything's Me Too. And then you have the generics who, who constantly fight with the brand and sue each other. And mm -hmm. that's a whole side, side show. Um, but look, I think that's a good idea. Look, I had somebody in the small group of doctor who took offense at my pens comment. I guess I need to clean up my pens comment because he doesn't believe that, that, that receiving pens influences him. And I said, I'm going to send you the pharmacopoeia. It, it absolutely it does. does. Yeah. Well, they've looked at prescribing practices in, in physicians that, that receive and get stuff before they got stuff and after they got stuff, and the prescriptions go up. So, but I need. It, I don't think that anybody uh, disagrees with whether money buys influence, whether it's subtle or not. It, it's certainly subconscious, in my opinion. Um, maybe we quibble about what price. Is, is, it, is it a pen or is it a check for five grand? Is it a pen or is it a weekend golf trip in Southern California? What is it? We know it works. These companies wouldn't be spending. F Pfizer in 2001 spent $1.4 million to buy pens for doctors. And they spent more the next year. They do it because it works. They're not doing it because it doesn't work. John, I think we have one, time for one Yeah, okay. Yeah. So um, you, you made the comments, I think, earlier about, um, you know, when you have someone there in front of you and, the, and they're, you know, they're suicidal or something, you know, you, you, even if there's a placebo effect, you, you do what you have to do. But, you know, also talking about there's all these other alternative options, um, yoga, exercise, counseling, and therapy, and so on and so forth, that would be equally, if not more, effective. And I think the problem comes down to who's going to pay for that? Um, everything is driven by who pays for it right now. And right now, our insurers are the, the payers for, for the great majority, if not all of our patients, right? Very few are paying for things out of, you know, completely out of pocket. And they'll pay for these medications. And so would it be a very different discussion if there was reimbursement or payment for a gym membership, if we had fully comprehensive mental health coverage beyond psychiatry to psychology and counseling and so on and so forth, would that change the, the, the dynamic and the discussion? And are the proceeds from all of these lawsuits against the pharmaceutical industry being utilized to accomplish the lobbying that would be necessary at a governmental level to ensure that these things are being paid for. So rather than you know just constantly spanking, which is is certainly due, are we utilizing our influence properly? Are we utilizing all these proceeds from these lawsuits that, that have good reason for coming to bear to ensure that we're changing the outcome in a way that we would fund all these therapies that would be far more effective, far less costly, and without all these other side effects that are there. So you made two huge points that was counterintuitive to me that I, I didn't understand this to be true. I know now what you say is true. I was like, well, what about poor people? Well, I don't poor people. Why are they taking drugs? Why don't they go get counseling? We don't pay for it. We pay for the drugs, and we don't pay for the counseling. The other thing is I had a slide. It didn't make it after, after Gotcha's uh, 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 accusation of organized crime. Mm -hmm. Uh, I had a list of the, the criminal penalties and criminal convictions. Somehow it didn't make it. But we have, so you're talking about the big fines, the criminal. It, it's something like $100 billion 
in the last 10 years of criminal fines and convictions against big pharma in the United States. And so where does that money go? Boy, what a great idea to take that money and to do something like you just suggested. But there's got to be will. There's got to be will. And people like in this room can, can, can generate, that, you know, like I said, you guys got good resumes. You can generate that sort of energy if you want to. I mean, I really think you can. All right, please join me in thanking Sean again. For his Should I, are you going to disclose that Marsha Angel is a bad person, though, I generally would. speaking? They, they know that. <laughs> okay. <I think. laughs> they know that. And I wouldn't trust him.